Hey, Jeremy, you know what we should do before we start the big show? I think you're going to say something here. <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> I think you're going to say something. We should read the comp winners. That's what I was going to say. We should read the comp winners, so Chris. So we have this software that takes all the advisors in our coaching group and benchmarks them against each other. They are in different groups or categories. So like you have Ford and GM in the American group, Toyota, Nissan in a group, Highline, etc. We are going to read the winners for last month. These are top performers, the best of the best, and they have been disguised with aliases. Cool, you know what I'm excited about? What? It's when we get the indie group going. As the independents start to We built that the other day. Yeah, absolutely. It's coming. Get ready for it. So in the American group, King <clears throat> Joe is the top manager. And the top advisor is Uncle Rich. Second place is The Closer. Third place is Shade. Fourth place is Hot Rod. And fifth place is Pitbull. Good job, you guys. In the Japanese group, the top manager is Chief Grady, who beat out Al Capone. Really? Yeah, Chief Grady beat now, Al Capone. Where does Chief Grady reside? Florida. Okay, cool. Al Capone, guess where Al Capone is? Uh, Chicago? Yeah, totally. <laughs> Top advisor in the Japanese comp, Carlitos. Nice. Second is C Pop. Third is Foster. Fourth is Just Mom. And five, fifth is Thorny. In the high line group, our top manager again is Monster. First advisor is Rover Hog. Second is Magic Mike. And third is Rooster. And in Euro import, import high line, Captain, Captain James. Captain comes from me, he's a huge Star Trek fan. I was thinking that. And a lot of his advisors are named after Star Trek characters okay. in here. It's a nice little cultural theme going there. Top advisor in Euro import, Amish Gangster, who's from Chicago. Second place is New Spock. They're one of captains. There we go. <laughs> and third place is Data, which is another one of captain's advisors. He's That's got, how you win, is your advisors have to be the in the top. He's got the team rolling. That's yeah, cool. he's got hitters rolling. <laughs> And then the Canadian comp top managers, Maverick. Good job, Maverick. First place advisors, Wolfman. And second place is Roadrunner. And then in the Asian Zing group, we have Big Tuna is the top manager. I love that name. <laughs> top advisor is Ren Polly. And second place is the real Mario, which I think is a dig at Mario. Ah, uh, yeah, there it Great is. job, you guys. Good job, guys. <laughs> Woo! Lots of records set and fun that was had in our advisor service manager competition. Welcome everybody to Service Driver Evolution. We have an exciting show for you today. We're gonna talk about the five reasons technicians aren't efficient. You're gonna see some things on that list that are probably gonna surprise you. We're gonna answer your questions. Don Rito is gonna be here again. He's kind of becoming a popular part of the show. And we're gonna talk about some industry news. How are you doing, Mr. Jeremy? Man, I am doing great. I've actually just completed like a two month hiatus from travel, I stayed home, worked on the business, you know, did all the training videos, got all that done. So it's been nice, man. How about you? I heard you've been traveling a lot. <laughs> You're just saying that to mess with me. <laughs> so you've had two months at home of just zen. Yeah, I, uh, I had- No travel whatsoever. One of my sponsors wanted me to do a class and I'm like, as long as it's in my backyard, I'll do it. And we sold it out in about a day. It worked out great. So had a 15 minute drive down to class and back home that night. No airplanes, no hotels for me. How have your hotel exploits been? <laughs> it's been? It's been terrible. So I am- um, not that long ago, I raised my prices because I was traveling too much and it made no difference whatsoever. It's almost like I booked up more. Yeah. And so these sort of things happen where like, I don't, for the last three weeks, I've only been home on the weekends. That's it. I've been oh, gone. Man. And um, like, say for example, so last week, I start off Monday and I fly to Cincinnati 
And then I do a couple days in Ohio. Then like on Wednesday, I get up at five. <laughs> this is the other thing that was crazy is for some reason, they decided not to have a rental car in Ohio that we were going to Uber everywhere. Have you ever tried to Uber in parts of Ohio? Well, I've been to Cincinnati before and it's like... It's but this is like a... 45 minutes outside of Cincinnati. Yeah, I've been to Dayton too. That's like in the burbs. Yeah, that's tough to get to. Yeah, so you can't really Uber and the Ubers that do show up are like, you know, the little oh, tiny man. Toyotas, that sort of thing. So we're Ubering from the hotel to, to the training center. And it's like literally 20 degrees. It's freezing. I've got a big suitcase. Oh my gosh. And, um, I'm standing outside in the cold. It, w it was the worst. So I get up at five in the morning. We um, Eastern time zone, right? Yeah, no, for sure. So it's like 2 a.m. here. Yeah. Okay. And, the, and the time zone change is, is impossible. So on Wednesday, I get up at five, get ready. We meet. We have a pre-meeting with the team. Then we go to the training center. We do training. For most of the day, then we rushed to Cincinnati to catch a flight. Right. So then I had to be in Phoenix to do a thing for these independent shops on Friday, right? Were they from Friday. Canada? They were from Canada. Yeah, yeah, they love Phoenix. They love their golf. Well, up there, they have to get their sun because it's so cloudy it's north of the morning. It is a good time to get out of Canada, come down, enjoy some of the southwestern weather that we have. So... Instead of me coming home, the decision was made that I'm going to go to Phoenix a day early because I'm speaking on Friday for them. So I get to the airport in Cincinnati in you know late afternoon, fly all the way to Phoenix, land at Phoenix, and guess who is in Phoenix? Our President Donald Trump, oh. they've landed Air Force One at the Phoenix airport sitting on the tarmac. No way. Yeah, so it's a, it's a disaster. <laughs> Christian, who was with me, who was then coming or going to Los Angeles, was delayed because nothing could take off because Air Force One was there. Oh, but we couldn't get out of the airport, the whole thing. So then the, the idea was that Thursday they were going to book me a bunch of strategy sessions and meetings and the whole thing. So... My whole day is full. I'm looking at this, this calendar and I'm like, man, I really hope the Wi-Fi is good wherever I'm going to be because, right. you know, I, here at the office, we pay extra to have the lines. Yeah. Going, yeah. So I w their meeting is at some place in Phoenix that I didn't even know Phoenix had casinos. Did you know that? Uh Outside of Phoenix, they do, I guess. Yeah, well, it's, yeah. it's pretty far out, but okay. it's like on your way back to California on the freeway, basically. So okay. it's like, I don't know, a little over 30 minutes to get there. So it's late at night. It's almost like 10 o'clock. I've been going. So now I've been going since 5 o'clock in Ohio. Yeah, so now you're at the 24-hour window. Yeah, it's clock, coming up right? on 1 midnight, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's mm -hmm. coming up on midnight, but it's, it's almost 10 o'clock there. And this casino is called like the the Burnt Match or something. I don't know. It's on an Indian reservation. It's a big, big casino. So I get okay. there. The driver drops me off. I get all my bags. I lug them through. I get to the reception desk at the casino for their hotel. And, you know, they're like, how can I, can I help you? And I'm like, Chris Collins checking in. And they like, look. What's your name again? And I'm like, you got my ID. Like, you know, I just hand them my, like, I just want to get to my room. Here's like, my I'm stuff. Done. Let me get to my room. I need to sleep. Right? I also have to pee really, really bad, too. <laughs> so she goes, we don't have a reservation for you. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, we don't have a reservation. So then I, no I text way. the office and they're like, well, they made the reservation. And um, I can show you all the emails back and forth that... Whatever, but is, is this does this tie into the hundred thousand dollar a year personal assistant? Yeah, like, kinda. Oh my for gosh. Sure. Okay. So usually when I look at my calendar and I hit that thing like the hotel, right. there'll be a reservation number. Yes. There's no reservation number. Oh no. So I have no reservation really, because if you don't have a reservation number, you don't have a reservation. The good news is you're in Phoenix. You could probably sleep out by the pool. <laughs> it's right? no, it's so, kind of cold. Well, it's kind of cold. And then how am I? Couple gonna, towels. How am I going to do the meetings and all that the next day? Just do them out by the pool. Poolside so strategy then, session. It's they're sold out. 
No rooms at all. No, because I'm like, okay, well, just give me a room, like, whatever. And she's like, well, we're sold out. We're fully committed, is what she said. And I'm like, oh, you got to be joking. So then I'm trying to figure it out. Ends up, they never made me a reservation. C complete, like, disaster. So then... Oh, wow. You think that that casino sold out, like, everything was sold out. Right. So and I call the on Dawes, which I usually stay at mm -hmm. when I'm at Phoenix. Sold out. I start calling around. The only place that had a room was the JW Marriott that was like 25 minutes uh -huh. away. Yeah. So then I call an Uber. I make the reservation. The lady's like, the only, the only room we have left is a casita. And it was super expensive. Okay. And at I, this I'm point, like, though, you don't care. I is the casita sleep. nice? She's like, yeah, whatever. So I'm like, okay. I call an Uber. This stupid casino hotel doesn't let Ubers come to valet. It's like around the corner and down the building, they have an Uber So you had to actually pickup. walk like three blocks? No, I told the Uber driver, I'm like, I'm not carrying all my stuff down there. You're <laughs> no. coming to valet. If I have to fight these guys, I will personally fight them at this point, right? Oh, now it's okay. like 1030. Right. I'm like, you, I'm not carrying my bags all the way down there. And I told the valet that. I'm like, so the Uber driver finally comes, but... He was already over there at that thing, and I had to, you know, walk him through it. So he comes around the building, gets me at valet. We drive the 25 minutes to the JW Marriott. So the JW Marriott there is, like, spread out. Mm -hmm. And so it's very evident when I get there that I'm only getting to my room in a golf cart. Oh. So I go to the – right when I get there, they take my bags. I go and I check in. And then I go back, and I'm like – I ask the reception, I'm like, is there an ATM? Because I know now i got a tip – the, dr the golf cart right. driver to drive me to my room. And they showed me the map when I'm checking in and my room's like, it seems like it's like three miles away. Oh my gosh. Like there's no way I'm lugging my bags. Right. Like at the casino, I'm like, no, I don't need help. Yeah, and right. I never planned on having to tip anybody for walking into my room because I hate to wait for them anyways, right? right? Just grab my stuff and No go. choice. So I asked the, the front desk, I'm like, is there an ATM? They're like, yeah, it's right out by the valet who had my bags. So I go out, there's two ATMs right there. I put my card in, put in my code, it says declined. So then I try the other one, it says declined. Then I pull out basically every card I have. No, nobody, I can't get any money out of this stupid ATM. Now we're coming up, it's almost 11 o'clock, oh right? So God. now I'm pretty much, we're going on 24 hours yes. here pretty quick, right? So then I just tell the kid, cause it's late at night, there's, o there's only two kids there, I'm like, I go, is the ATM broken? He goes, no, somebody just got money out of it a minute ago. <laughs> I'm like, oh, come on. Oh, my gosh. I'm like, bro, I don't know what to say. I don't have any cash. I'll tip you guys tomorrow. And he kind of, like, got cold with me. And then the guy drove me to the room. And even when he drove me to the room, which was literally, you know, a mile away and way in the back, up on the mountain somewhere, and I'm thinking, man, the Wi-Fi better be good out here in this thing. <laughs> no He's wait he sits all. there and waits. Like, you know, like, oh, tip yeah. me, you know. I'm going to give him a high five. I'm gonna be like, here you go, bro. Here I feel so go. bad. Like, that stuff messes with my head because I feel guilty. Like, I feel guilty if I don't tip housekeeping. Like, I literally mm. in a hotel will go to an ATM, pull cash right. out, get change, and go back to the room and leave it for housekeeping because I feel guilty. Okay. I don't know. My mom, like, raised me that way because no, she used to be a waitress. And so she was always like, you always got a tip, you know. She would come home with her tips and it was like it's cause you don't, exciting. It's because you don't have a dark spot on your soul like I do. It's, there's a part of me that's like, well, it is what it is. Moving on. Let's go. Oh, High it's five. the worst. It is. Yes. You can't trust clients. To, I don't <clears throat> see what happened is we used to have a salesperson here that would have double checked that. But she's so not you let us. the client control your reservation? No, never. Right. You're like she knew, but since she's gone, nobody knew because I usually don't do this sort of thing. Right. It was an anomaly. Mm -hmm. They don't know that you can't trust clients. Yeah. You do not trust them with anything. No. The They're last, disorganized. The last time I did that was in Dayton, Ohio, and I got into the hotel and I slept in the bathtub, and then why the, did you sleep in the bathtub? Because the bed was moving. So I didn't want bed bugs, so I slept in the bathtub with the pillow. Oh, that's the worst. Yeah, it was really bad. So I got my own. You room saw the, the bed bugs? Yeah, like really bad. And then just like, I've it, never and it was like at two bugs. in the morning. So I was like, no, I've only I'm not. read the reviews online. Like I'll look yeah. at the hotel reservation, I'll read the reviews, and it says bed bugs, and I won't go. Yeah, absolutely. I drove. I drove yeah. an hour once in yeah. the Midwest to not stay at the hotel I, I don't the dealer blame. owned. 
So he owned the only and hotel bed bugs? in the little town that he wow. was in. And I drove an hour. This is crazy. Because I wasn't going to I we, wasn't going to stay We should in his have hotel. Travelocity sponsor this segment of the show, right? right? It's the like, worst. Dude, absolutely. So yeah, no, I can't. I'm done with the travel. Like I'm And I'm and here done. I go yeah, we're dragging you uh we drug you to uh, Kansas City and all this. That's so different though. Yeah, right? Like that's not really I don't see that as work. Okay. I don't have to speak. You're the one doing all the work. So yeah. it most what I am is your wingman. I'm there, there to make it easier for you. Yeah. Right? So, so have you ever slept in your meeting room? No. So that happened to me too in Dayton. They you gave, slept in your meeting well, room? Well, they gave my room away and I showed up so late I forgot to call. I, get, I don't know what happened. But then I'm like, well, I'm doing a meeting here tomorrow. Can I just go see the meeting room? And there was a fold-out bed in the meeting room with a shower. So I just slept in the meeting room and what got up. What kind of meeting room is this? It was... It was 40, 50 people. Why did it have a shower? It was, that's how it was set up at the hotel. They actually had a bathroom with a full shower and a pull-out bed. I'm like, score. So Wait, so you never you, know. I just realized something. You made our reservation in Kansas. Uh, yeah. There better be a... Somebody <laughs> better double-check that reservation because I'm not sleeping in a meeting room. If, if I have a room and you don't, you can have my room and I'll go no, sleep. No, that would make me feel terrible. No, You're there no, to no. speak. I'm there just to I don't to sleep in Kansas City around. anyways. I stay up... 24 7? Yes. Yeah. Do you party like that? Mm hmm. Okay. Well, one thing traveling Excellent. with me, I'm, I'm sure you're excited to do this. I'm in bed by 8 30. Perfect. Excellent. You're a still out going. AM, right? First of all, there's <laughs> nothing going on in Kansas City that you'd stay up that late. There are certain things. That there happen. is nothing going on in Kansas City there to is. make you stay there's up a, that There's late. a lot of deep conversations that happen down in the bar at that Drunk. Time. Time. Yes. You not me. No, you not me. Remember no. them conversations. Oh, well. Uh, yeah, you remember them. Actually, no. I um, when I was when I was in Toronto, I had a couple really good conversations with some guys late at a bar that was really cool. Like, I don't know. I like to get to know people. I'm curious about people, so it was it was fun. Yeah, absolutely. It was really yes, we're gonna have a great time. What's next on our list? Um, so let's. You want to talk so, about some news? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's fix board right now. So everybody watching this, everybody forward. What we're about to say to the CEO of Ford. Because he needs to hear this because it's not working out. Bill You're probably Ford not going to be the CEO very long. Probably not. They, a lot of I don't, how many out. quarters in a row have they lost money? 18. Ford stock has hit a 10-year low. Ford replaced CEO Mark Fields with Hackett in May 2017 after dismal stock performance. And the value of Ford stock has continued to wither. Ford hovers around $8 a share. Crosstown rival General Motors has a stock price of $35. There's a lot in that. It just shows you that... Read that, between the lines, Jeremy. Okay. What's in there? Well... Because I have an idea. What do you think it is? I, well, I, you know the solution, right? Who should, I have an who, idea. Who There's this they... guy out there that basically owns everything. That Ford is running his software in some of their cars. Okay. He, he goes by the title richest man in the world, Jeff he, Bezos. Yep. Very smart man. He also has this website where tons of customers go there to buy stuff every day. And over 100 million of them pay a fee every year to just buy. Yeah, more people it, have right? Amazon Prime than have a telephone line. Right, is that crazy? That's it is nuts. crazy. It is. Yes. He has the largest airline in the world. Okay. Amazon Prime Air or whatever it's called. Yes. Right? Why not let him buy Ford? Because you're going to lose the heritage of Ford. There's no heritage. Well, yes, there is. What, that it, they own it, the Detroit it, Lions and you, they haven't won in 40 years? No, what, there's... What's the heritage? The Detroit Lions? No. The They're Ford, rebuilding again the this Ford year. The Ford name. Right. Well, Ford is always rebuilding, so they're... They're not losing the Ford name. <sighs> Roll that Ford stock into Amazon stock. That's well, okay. what I'm saying. Well, that might devalue Amazon stock too much. <laughs> no. <laughs> it Amazon's so much bigger. Why? Well, I, I know. I, I understand. Uh, there's a lot like of, I think, um, what do you think Ford is valued at now at $8 a share? Oh, I have, it's I have probably no like 30 billion, 40 right. billion. Yeah. It's not that much. If GM is 60 billion, Ford isn't worth that much. You would be better off rolling that stock into Amazon. Let Amazon buy it. They have a network to sell, right? They're going to think a little bit different. They're going to sell direct to consumer. 
um, with the electric, they will. I don't think um, I don't think they can with gas yet. But I don't know. Sorry. They have enough money to. Every country is going to outlaw the internal combustion engine anyway, so we are going to have electric vehicles. Listen, here this soon. would be so great for the Ford dealers because they would start having Amazon Prime pickups in their showroom, <laughs> just like Whole right. Foods. Right. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. People would come there to pick up their books. Yep. He like he does that at Whole Foods now. Since he bought Whole Foods, you can go there and pick up stuff. They have the lockers. Mm -hmm. Dealerships need traffic. Think about four dealers would have Amazon Prime pickup in there. You could have a drone airport there that pretty soon they'll be dropping off stuff with drones. Think about all the activity that there would be at four dealerships. That's true. It would be great for four dealers. It would be, absolutely. Yes. Your parts department would have books. It would have tampons, bubble gum, <laughs> oh, tequila, everything in parts. What Think is, about it. What is happening to the automotive? You'd have little robots oh. driving around in the parts department picking stuff up. <laughs> Things would start happening. You're right, absolutely. And Ford has fallen asleep. <laughs> so Ford needs to Roll wake up. Roll the Ford stock. What's the CEO's name? It's right there. Hackett? Yeah, Please. hack it. You're not going to be there long, bro. You <laughs> might as well call Bezos. Get it I'm done I'm sure now. he'll take your call. Get it done I've now. heard the rumors already that they're in the, in the market to buy a car company. It makes perfect sense. It absolutely does. It absolutely it does. It would be now, great for now, the dealers. It would be great for Amazon. And it would definitely be great for Ford. And I don't know. Bezos is talking about buying the Seattle Seahawks. You the should, you should broker, keep the losing Detroit Lions You should forever. broker this deal and just take a percentage of it. No, I'm. It, this is genius. You guys need to listen. I'm ahead <laughs> of the curve on most yes, of you this are. stuff. Yes, you, you are. You need to pay attention. Ford dealers, you need to start some sort of letter signing campaign. Grassroots up. Move it up from the, from the dealership up. Absolutely. Because it would, it would pick up like lightning. Yep, absolutely. That, that's exactly the kind of leadership that Ford is missing right now. And I don't know that the Ford family has any influence whatsoever except for going to a board meeting and firing the CEO. <sighs> They're way behind on everything. Like, this just puts them at the front. I agree. Also, what's that truck company that Bezos invested in? The electric truck? Oh, you would have to put me on the spot and ask me that. Whatever question. it is, the Rizzo, the Rizo, something. The, roll that right in, too. It'd be one big happy family. Yeah, they're doing amazing, too. Okay. You're welcome, Ford. You're welcome. Okay, you ready for the next one? Tesla autopilot system found probably at fault in 2018 crash. Tesla just got permission to break ground on their German gigafactory, but maybe in hot water in the U.S., their autopilot driver's assistance system and a driver who relied too heavily on it are likely to blame for a 2018 crash in California in which the driver died. I think it's a good story. Good. What do you mean good story? Well, I, th I mean, I'm, it's tragic, however it's good. There's a lot of good that will come out of this. It's tragic, however it's good. Well, somebody died. It's like a sad country song. <laughs> All country songs are sad. You play it backwards, you get your wife back, you get your They dog shouldn't back. even label country music as music. Why do you why do you think it's good? I don't understand. Because this is this gonna took a this turn is, I did not anticipate. This is gonna push the autonomous vehicle faster out to the public. You know, I want my car that drives me around. Here's the thing, I have a question for you. Okay. Is the is the uh, autonomous driving system on a Tesla safer than humans driving? Yes, especially women drivers. Yeah. A hundred percent. But take Spit. women out of it. Is it safer than humans? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. The only reason this makes the news is because it happened. Correct. Because if you take the autopilot versus human air, mm -hmm. humans cause way more accidents. Yes. Think about how many Teslas are out there driving with this that don't crash. One crashes. And it's One. terrible. One. It's terrible that there right. was a fatality. I agree. But it's still probably 10 times safer than humans driving. Yes. And if you look into that story, the driver was probably using the vehicle in a way that the autonomous programming wasn't designed for. So the dr it was more driver error than actually the yeah. autonomous vehicle error. So, yeah, I, I agree. So that. I don't think every time an autonomous car crashes, we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater because it's Absolutely. still safer than most of you. It's definitely safer than Christian's driving. They're gonna, works they're, they're, He's a crazy we're driver. We're going to have a bunch of have women. Have you ever read with Christian? Road with Christian? I won't ride with him. Have you ever read with? What is wrong with me? Well, I have read with him. I've done a coaching call with him. 
Well, he can't drive to save his life. He's crazy. Oh, my gosh. He's a terrible driver. No, well, that's the thing. When we went to... Where's um, he from? So the reason why, the true reason why we didn't have a rental car in Ohio... It's they because they didn't want... They saw his driver's said, license. Your sister said, but I thought you wouldn't ride with Christian anymore. Oh, no. That's what she said. And I really? said, um, hey, um, I have a driver's license. <laughs> you can drive. I can drive. Everybody's so used to taking that's care funny. of me. Right. They, they forget They don't that, let you drive anymore. Yeah, I drive, too. I would have much That's rather funny. driven. Where's his his phone number is uh, six three zero. Where's that from? Uh, Illinois. Okay, that's why. So it's from where he's from. People from Illinois can't drive. Correct, they can't. No. Why? What's Cal the theory there? So I go to Minneapolis one time, and uh, there's this van in the fast lane, and literally it's moving like forty five miles an hour, and it's swerving all over the place. Almost hits the wall. Almost hits the car next. And so I speed and go past, and the person, she's on her phone. So number one, women drivers can't drive. Number two, uh, don't text and drive. That's the other thing. And people in Minneapolis absolutely cannot multitask and drive. Out here in California, we have it mastered. Like, we can have a burrito, you know, our iced tea, and text and do all that. Not that we text and drive, but we can multitask in the car. We're pros at it because it's just, you know, look outside and look at the freeway. Uh, in the other states, in the middle part of the country, they're not good at it so i, I would uh, so let me let me um make a counter to your oh women driver so much trouble uh, how do you drag me into this chris is insurance for women lower or higher than men what lower why is that i don't know do you know why because they're better drivers i think we should ask don they're safer drivers don rito that's yeah. a good that's a good point we it will is. ask don because the next segment that we have for you here on the big drive of se big, <laughs> the next segment we have on the big show. I'm so tired. I'm delusional. You're getting the delirious here. The next segment I'm... we have for you here on Service Drive Revolution is your questions. And remember, when you ask questions, whether you send them to info at chriscollinsinc.com, you put them on YouTube, LinkedIn, wherever they come from. We will send you some swag if your question makes it on the air. Swag. We should set up email for Service Drive Revolution. We should, absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll get them on that. that. We'll get the team on that. Okay, okay, Don, do we have any good questions this week? Oh, as always, our listeners always submit the best questions. Chris, you ought to know that. Don, I, I got a question for you first. Yes, sir. How do you keep your skin so <laughs> polishly orange? <laughs> You know, uh, actually, that's a, that's a funny story. Back in grade school, they used to call me Don Cheeto. Um, Don Cheeto. The scars run very deep on that. Like a hot Cheeto? No, just a, just a regular Cheeto on account of the... He's uh, probably glad they didn't have the Flamin' Hot back then. It's just regular Cheeto paste. You know what a lot of people <laughs> here in California do, Don, is they, uh, they smoke cannabis and then they crave Cheetos. Yes, well, I know about the first part, but I, I, I do not eat Cheetos out they of... Uh, the munchies. Yes. A lot of, a lot of um, younger kids are doing that. Yes, but see, I, I, I've been in prison for too long and have too much of a grudge against Cheetos to, uh, to do what such childish things. What kind of drugs do you get in prison? Oh, all, all kinds. Do they make moonshine in prison? <laughs> oh, no. Absolutely. Prison? I, I make it in my toilet. I got some Pri moonshine I want you to taste and prison see if, they, if, it's like, um, if it's like toilet moonshine. I'm sure it's not. Our toilet moonshine was the best quality. Wait, wait, you got to get his parole officer approval first. Don't just Yeah, you're not stuff. supposed to be we, drinking. We don't My parole officer trouble. would never approve. Hey, his attendance Don, is by the way, everybody, wrong. Don went to prison because he was selling stuff to customers they didn't need. It's true. Taking that can of oil. But he learned his lesson. Down. He's a new man. We're giving him a chance here on yes. Service Drive Revolution. He's doing... What the heck Okay, what's that? the first question? The first question is... From Mario. Hey, Chris, you mentioned the book Wooden. He has several books. Which one would you recommend to start with for our group? Thanks, Mario. Oh, that's a good question. So the best wooden book, in my opinion, I don't know if your opinion is different, is the one that's called A Lifetime of Observations and Reflections on and off the court, Wooden. It's just called Wooden. That's it's awesome. co-written with Steve Jameson, but that's the one I give away and the one that, um, you know, I really, I've read it a couple times and it's amazing. You want me to read you a little excerpt, Don? Would we get into copyright trouble with that? Uh, maybe, but we'll, it's okay. You'll go to jail, I won't. Yes. <laughs> I'm not on Actually, that, that, is, that is true, but YOLO, I guess. 
My favorite maxims, happiness begins where selfishness ends. Earn the right to be proud and confident. The best way to improve the team is to improve ourselves. Big things are accomplished only through the perfection of minor details. Discipline yourself and others won't need to. Ability may get you to the top, but it takes character to keep you there. I will get ready and then perhaps my chance will come. If I am through learning, I am through. If you don't have the time to do it right, when will you find the time to do it over? That's a good one. That is a really good the one. The smallest good deed is better than the best intention. That's awesome. That's uh, Wooden's favorite maxim. There's pages and pages of it in the back. Absolutely. It is one of the most beautiful compensations of this life that no man can sincerely help another without helping himself. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Do not permit what you cannot do to interfere with what you can do. Be more concerned with your character than with your reputation. Character is what you really are. Reputation is merely what you are perceived to be. They should put that next to the Hollywood sign. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. Come on. Good one. So there you go, Mario. A lifetime of observations and reflections on and off the court wooden. That's the, that's the book I would um, recommend. Yeah. What's the next question? Next question <clears throat> comes from Sean. My name is Sean. Awesome. And I'm new to the service manager business. I need help bad. The previous service manager really had a bad reputation, and so does the dealership itself. I'm trying to build it up and have ordered your books. The problem I have is I'm over parts and service, but I'm stretched thin. I work six to seven days, 12 to 13 hours, and if someone misses, I feel the roll. Most of the time, I'm on the service lane myself. We write around 11 to 15 ROs a day, 80% warranty, 20% cash. ELR around 88.7. That is a very specific number to approximate. That's, I have, um, by the way, Don, you don't know this really, but that's an ELR from before you went to prison, like 1984. Mm, that is <laughs> it's a low ELR. Sounds like you're describing a dealership in San Bernardino, California. <laughs> I have four techs. One is a standout. The other three, not so good. I'm in a small town, and I will have to say it's welfare infested. Techs are hard to come by here. I love to build the reputation back up. I feel like I take two steps forward and nine steps back. Any help, please? You want me to handle this one? Yeah. Okay. A couple things. Let's talk this about is a crisis. Well, it is, but it's easy to fix. I think a uh, couple things. First and foremost, you got to look at the reputation. With your reputation, you build it with one client at a time. You have a client base, so just get everybody committed to delivering that five star experience every time now. And in 90 days, you'll have a completely different reputation than what was in the past. Uh, the other thing, too, um, I'm just going to go to coaching. Like, who is there to support you, right? Like, if you're really feeling that bad about the dealership that you work at, the past service manager, uh, get some help. Get a coach to help you stay on track, stay on task, get a priority list of strategies that need to be implemented and implement them. So absolutely coaching. And then that reputation, I think, is key. And then... Don't worry about welfare infestation. It's it's rampant everywhere in the United States nowadays. Yep. You need you need a community. It's a lonely place it is. sometimes to Absolutely. be the service manager. It can be very lonely. Yep. So you need some you need to surround yourself with some better people. Double your labor rate right away. That will uh Kick out the people that can't afford it, that don't want to afford it, and just attract the right customers to you. That's <laughs> double your labor. Well, you can, right? Well, you could, but I don't know. Just go to one. Go to effective one, labor rate. One ten. That's so low. I don't know what the brand is. Like there just aren't enough specifics here to talk about what what he should go to. But we had an extended warranty say that our area was at one hundred six thirty two an hour on average. I was just happy it was over a hundred. So no, it's so we, it's we so funny. When I'm, when I'm with dealers, they think that the reason why independents do so well is because their labor rate's lower, <laughs> right? And most of the time, the independents are higher. Right, absolutely. It's, it's about the customer experience. It is. And it, I mean, the sad part is we're all fighting for the same technicians. You know, we have dealership technicians that leave and come to the independent. We have independent technicians that go to the dealership. So we're all fighting for the same talent pool. And it's- The most successful on both sides are the ones that concentrate on what they can control. Yes. They don't worry about the competition. They worry about 
their customer experience and what they collecting the best people and delivering the best product. Yeah, and, and Sean, that's what you have to do. You have to set your standards and go make your your history right now. It, what you're doing is building your book of business the way that you're going to do it, and then just don't worry about the past. Make it happen. Good stuff. Yeah. You got another one? Yes, yes, we do have another one. Uh, this one comes from Andrew on Facebook. I recently got employed by a dealership. Literally my first week. Congratulations. And I am... I would applaud, but as you know, I cannot use three of my limbs. I am honestly very grateful and hungry to succeed. I would consider myself an honest service advisor when recommending services or whatever the case may be. And it has worked great at a mom and pop shop, but now, since I'm at a dealership, they want you to push services such as additives, which can, which I can in good taste, but I'm worried about pricing for my customers. Since I'm in such a competitive area, Miami, how can I sell my customers on the value rather than the price and the services they're receiving? Also, do you have any good techniques to assure the customers fill out their surveys for my KPI score? So that's three questions, right? <laughs> yeah, I've got pricing value, fill out the survey. So the, fir the first thing I would say is when it comes to additives, I wouldn't sell anything that you wouldn't sell your mom. Yeah, do the research on it first. Make sure that you believe in the product before you now, start Now, if you're working it. for a service manager that is more aggressive and not in line with your ethics, you, you probably need to, um, you need to do a little soul searching there. But I personally find that there's so many things that we can sell customers. There is no reason for us to oversell, over recommend. So if you wouldn't sell it to your mom, I, w I wouldn't sell it. Then the second one is value. Now, what is value to a customer? What makes a good deal? The answer is when the cost in the, no, when the value outweighs the cost, right? right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times in your role as a service advisor, you're creating that value by making it easy, saving them time, keeping them in a safe, mm -hmm. dependable vehicle, being personal, be their person that's always available Standing to them. behind the product, right? So Updating how, them when they don't expect it. Right, and, and the pricing thing, you can't, uh, Andrew, you've gotta be careful on because the lowest price sometimes carries the highest cost. Like you put a $400 radiator in that has a six month, 6,000 mile guarantee versus an $800 radiator that has a three year, 36,000 mile guarantee. Yeah, it's $400 more, but if this one fails in month seven, you gotta pay for it again. Now you're at the same price as the more, more expensive one, right? But no, this one's gonna cost you $2,000 because every seven months you've gotta put one in, right? So the pricing thing, customers always wanna drag you in on price because they're just not educated. They don't know how to see the value in auto repair. And that's where you petting the dog and being that trusted advisor for your customer will help you win that pricing war and show them the value of what you guys provide. When I was an advisor, I always thought that I was worth more. Mm -hmm. Like if I was gonna take care of you and you were gonna be my customer, you were gonna pay more for that, but you were gonna get my attention. Because I knew in the service drive I was in, nobody else was as good as me. And if you had me as an advisor, you were getting the best. So a lot of it too is you having some confidence in delivering something that's worth more. You, you know, I, I always tell the story about my grandfather told me when I was really young, that if you always give people more than what they pay you for, you'll always be in demand. Mm -hmm. So if somebody pays you $8 an hour and you give them $20 worth of work every hour, you will always be in demand. So I approach that like I would call customers when they didn't expect it. I would take care of them like they didn't expect it. I was better than everybody else and they were gonna pay a premium for that. And, and then, then what was the last question? Uh, how to get them to fill out their survey. Mm -hmm. So. I've got it summed up really easy. Deliver such an amazing service experience that they want to share that experience with the world. That's the biggest thing. You've got to blow Wait, their Wait, I thought off. it was it threatened to come to their house and break their knees. <laughs> no, you could do that. It's Miami. <laughs> it, it, that's right. Just get a silencer for your Glock, right? That's all you <laughs> No, need. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Yeah, deliver such an amazing experience and do something special for them at the end. You know, one thing that we used to do when, when I worked, whatever car line you were for, but it was funny, you'd work, I worked at Volkswagen, and there would be 20 white Volkswagen Jettas out there, and there's four customers out there hitting their beepers trying to find their car, and four alarms are going off at the same time. Yeah, my customers would be catered to right up front with their car backed in, the door open, I'd walk them to the car. So those are some of the smaller things that you can do to really wow them. And then on the survey, they will fill it out if you do an amazing job for them. I would say too, we have a bunch of clients in Florida, in Miami, um, a couple really good dealers and a couple dealer groups. If you get your numbers up and you're performing at a high level and you, ha and you have good CSI, send me your resume and we'll pass it around, but we'll get you to a dealer that isn't, um, isn't trying to make you sell stuff that people don't need. Absolutely. That's good. Correct. Great question. Well, thanks so much, Don. Good job. Great questions this week. Um, stay out of trouble because people are starting to um, love your bit here on the show and we don't want you to go back to jail. It would be a shame for me to have to leave the country on such short notice, Chris. <laughs> no, we could, we could take the show international. Yeah, it's we could. Fine. We have people in Canada, right? We, do. Well, we have a lot of friends in Canada, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Mario, Sean, and Andrew. We got some swag coming your way. So, great job. Thanks, Don. You're welcome. Thanks, Michael. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to talk about the five... No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. I know you've been traveling a lot, and uh, I have a gift for you. Is it caffeine? No, it's something even better. I saw that, and I was like, that is just the ultimate oh, that's gift dope. For, for Mr. Collins. So it is a... Whiskey mug or tequila mug that then holds a cigar on the side. Yeah, but there's something even better I found out. Open that up. Open it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to Just rip it. it there we go. <laughs> like a little kid. So now, if you don't have a cigar, this glass is absolutely amazing because you can put your finger in there and not drop your drink. <laughs> oh, so if you're like really drunk. <laughs> yes. and so if you're listening to this, it has like a little slot on the side of the glass where you could stick a cigar in there. Yep. But you also can stick your finger in there, and it kind of becomes a little handle. Exactly. So if you're a lazy, that's what you were thinking. If you're a lazy drinker, the glass. Yeah. Also, itself. since my doctor says I can only smoke one cigar a month. All right. He cut me out of bacon. And, Are you serious? Uh, yeah, I don't eat bacon anymore. I thought bacon was good for you. No, evidently it's like the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes and carcinogens. What we're drinking tequila? Yeah. What is this tequila? There what does it say? It says um, Dulce um, Margara Extra Nejo Tequila Collector's Edition, a must for any tequila connoisseur. This selection is crafted using traditional methods housed in a handmade, hand-painted ceramic bottle. The bottle's amazing. What if I break it? Um, yeah, then we're, we're going to not be able to taste it. I don't know if that twists it. off or if it pops off. Sorry, I'm struggling here, guys. Oh, it was a... Let's um, put it Ooh, in our service that drive revolution really, really cup. Nice. Okay, now while we're doing that, let's talk about the five reasons technicians aren't efficient. Oh, look at the... Number five one. reasons. I know the first one. Okay. Smoking and vaping. <laughs> Just going to say it. <laughs> no, the first one is the parts department. The parts department. Why are you throwing the parts department under the bus already? That's always what the techs say. <laughs> the, well, yeah, if there's a long line out of parts, it's absolutely. Always parts it's always parts fault. It's always I've never gone into a, a shop where they didn't say that it was the parts department. Look at the color of that. Holy cow. That's beautiful. For our listening audience, I just poured some tequila into the new The bike. new glass. We can't yeah. smoke cigars here in this. Oh, uh, next time. Room. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go with smoking and vaping. <clears throat> smoking and vaping is number one. And, okay. Yep. What is the number two reason technicians aren't efficient? Sexting. Sexting? No, I mean texting. I'm sorry. <laughs> technicians are sexting? Yeah, probably. What because... kind of technicians do you have in your shop? No, this isn't my shop. This is a survey of all technicians all across North America, Canada That they're included. sexting? Yes. Like they're sending pictures of their family jewels? To the cashier or whoever. Now, HR department, you got to pay attention to this because that could... Definitely get you guys in some hot water. So that's not number two. Number two is it's the parts department. It's the parts department. <laughs> awesome. Okay. What's, what's number three? Number um, number three is the parts department. <laughs> <laughs> 
he, he really has the parts part written out as number three right now, so that is actually funny. <laughs> Have you ever department. gone into a shop where they didn't say it was the parts department? No, well, let's hold on. Let's just pause here real quick. So two sides of the coin. Uh, dealership world, yes, the parts department can slow down production immensely. If a technician has to go, let's say a tech's working on four repair orders a day, and he's standing in line for parts 10 minutes a day, how many minutes is that? Say that again? I was just drinking tequila. <laughs> I didn't know I was taking I'll, the I'll give you the I didn't answer. know I was taking the SATs. <laughs> Four repair orders a day, 10 minutes at the park counter. 40 on, minutes. Is 40 minutes. Okay, that's a lot of money that it's you're wasting. It is. So that's no reason why some technicians can't hit the magical 100% on efficiency or productivity. Now, in the independent world, the service advisor is the parts department. So... The challenge is if you mess up an order and you have a car on the rack and you don't have a part and now your technician has to stop, that costs the shop a lot of money. So you've got to make sure parts arrive on time and that the parts are actually there. Okay, the, actually the number three that we have is they don't have a system. <laughs> threw me for a curveball there, yes. Uh, tell me about a system. They, they just, the really good technicians that flag a lot of hours have a system for how they pull in the cars, how they inspect the cars, how they handle parts, how they get another car going. Like the really good ones will have two cars going, they'll have one underneath the other car, but they have a system. They're consistent in their system that they inspect every car the same every yes. time. They don't take shortcuts, that sort of thing, right? Okay. So they actually run their little business out of their bay like a business or a franchise model would where they have duplicatable systems that are done the same way every time. So they don't miss stuff. Yeah, the other one I would say with that is the really good techs understand that there's a customer attached to this car. They don't look at it like, mm -hmm. hey, it's a you know 2010 F-150. Okay. They're like, there's, there's a mom that's driving kids to soccer practice that has to be to work on time, that is in a hurry and doesn't have time to break down. And so there's a human behind every vehicle. It's not just a vehicle. Interesting. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah. It, um, it's powerful to think that way because there's, you know, there's somebody behind it. it. When you're impersonal, you'll take shortcuts. Your quality isn't as good. And you also won't inspect them the same way. Because if you care about them, like let's say it was your mom's car right. and you saw a leak, you saw a belt, you saw a hose, you would tell them, hey, you should do that. You don't want to break down. But instead we prejudge, we get in a hurry, mm -hmm. we take shortcuts. We don't want to do the hose, so we won't recommend it because it's in a spot we don't want to do. Absolutely. And remember, our repairs can become like a time machine, right? Because it's much easier to take care of things while there's smaller problems in the shop rather than out on the road as a breakdown. So humanizing it is absolutely key. And then with the system too, cleaning up after you work, right? Like I'm not a good technician, but and I have a cart with tools in it and I just throw everything in the top. And then our new technician, Levi, has done just an amazing job. First week he came in. Shout so, out Levi. Shout out Levi. There we go. Yep. Uh, set a record, flag, flag right hours. And I watch how he works. He's very methodical. And when he finishes the job, he makes sure that he cleans up and puts everything back where it goes. So he takes a little bit more time at the end, but it speeds him up getting into the next one. So he's not searching for tools and stuff. So yeah, having a, a great system, absolutely. You don't have a system. Oh, I'm not, not as a technician, because I don't make my living as a tech. Number four. Number four. That the was parts department. The <laughs> number four is I have they, do, that they don't understand what the advisors are doing. Okay. They don't work with the advisors. So there's no team effort there? Yeah, well, they, they just don't understand what process the advisors are going through. They just assume that the advisors don't know how to get descriptions. They don't communicate with them. They don't spend time with them. Yeah. They don't understand that it's a law of averages, that if you, if you inspect 10 vehicles, you're going to sell like 30%. So what you're telling me that some technicians will base their recommendations off of what a service advisor sells or doesn't sell? So part of that as well? Yeah, so they, they prejudge. They prejudge based off of the advisor. Okay. Now the number five reason why technicians aren't efficient. I know the answer. I know the answer. Parts, Parts department. department. <laughs> No, the number five, this was yours and it's really, really good. Untrained service advisors. Yes, service advisors that cannot sell. They can't close the deal. They're not trained. They don't know what they're doing. They don't connect with customers. Yep. Terrible service advisors will kill Horrible the shop. Horrible write-ups. 
Yep. yep. Bad descriptions. Oh, absolutely. They don't document every concern. They don't have the customer bought into the inspection process. All of that. They don't call the customer. They don't have the right phone number. They don't get the work okayed while it's still in the tech stall. The tech's got to pull it in and out. Oh, that's right? painful. Because they didn't get the right number. They didn't communicate. All of that. And then when they do call them, they don't know how to sell the work. Like it always blows me away when you go into a, a service department, you go through repair orders and customers decline breaks. It's like, how do you decline breaks? You're going to go get I them did, done somewhere else. I didn't come in for breaks today. But when I call on declines, most of the time the customers all say like, hey, Jeremy, I see you were in here last week and we're just trying to get better. And we recommended breaks. And I was just wondering why you didn't have that taken care of mm. while you're here. And we have a system for that, too. And you know what? Um, what's the system? The piggy bank system. You put oh. that one in your piggy bank. And the you Chris do. Collins but bank you know what they say most of the time? What? They didn't tell me until I came to pick it up. Oh, that's... So the and advisors never called while I was still in the store. They didn't even ask for the sale? Nope. Wow. So can I share a quick story with you? Yeah. So I had a uh, vehicle that I took over to one of our local dealerships, and I got to be the customer and go through the sales presentation from the service advisor. And it was very painful. And so the guy, you know, gets me on the phone and I said, yep, go ahead. Uh, what do you got? And I had a very specific concern that I took the car in for, right? And so he goes into this thing and then glosses over my concern. And then he's telling me about this and this and this and this. And the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, if I was a customer, I'd probably hang up on you. Because there's just no flow to it. There was, it was really like he was just reading off the repair order, just going down things. And... After like 15 seconds, I totally tuned out. And then at the end of his, I don't know, five minute presentation, I said, okay, so what's it gonna take to fix what I brought it in for? And so as an advisor, there's an art and a flow to how you present what the vehicle needs. And if you're just going off of a list and say that we found this and my technician also found this, your customers are tuning out. There's no passion there. There's no purpose behind it rather than just telling the customer what the list is. So. Sometimes we have to go on the other side and be the customer to feel what they go through in the presentations as well. So untrained service advisors are definitely a reason why our technicians are not uh, hitting their numbers or why they're unproductive. So, And there could have been a sixth one, but we decided to leave it off and that would have been the parts department. The parts department, absolutely. <laughs> That's awesome. So five reasons why technicians aren't efficient. We fixed Ford. We the fixed Ford, Ford Motor Company. I'm expecting a case of tequila and and maybe some love from the Ford Motor Company for putting this you, Bezos Ford thing together. You do know I only drink here. This is the only place that I consume alcohol. Well, that's a shame. No, it's not. Why don't you drink? I I'm always working. So. Well, you can't. Oh yeah, I guess you can't work and drink. I don't know. <laughs> Depends <laughs> you know, on what you do, you right? Yeah, absolutely. You could. That was a great show. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, you guys, for tuning in. We really appreciate it. And share it with your friends and family. Like it. Subscribe. And we will be here again for you next week, and we'll see you real soon. Absolutely. Thanks for watching this episode of Service Drive Revolution. If you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the comments below. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're notified when we post new episodes. I'm Chris Collins and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Chris Bulldog Collins. And I'll see you again on the next episode.